Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Phil Mackesy. Doug Casey is founder and chairman of Casey Research. Visit Doug at CaseyResearch.com. Hey, Doug, it's always good to have you back on This Week in Money. It's always my pleasure, Phil. You are just back from Freedom Fest in beautiful, surreal Las Vegas, and you're here in Vancouver July 27th for the Capitalism and Morality Seminar. That doesn't surprise a lot of folks, Doug, who know that you're a libertarian. For our listeners who might not be familiar with that term, what is a libertarian? A libertarian is somebody that believes in a maximum of both uh, economic freedom and social freedom. So I like to think that we take the best of what the liberals like and the best of what the conservatives like and we throw away the things that are negative about both of them because, of course, the, some of these people, the, the, the conservatives don't like social freedom and the liberals don't like economic freedom. We, we want a maximum of both. We want to see free minds and free markets, and we believe in not initiating violence against anybody yeah. either. So that, that sums up what a libertarian is. Sounds like a pretty good mix. Now, how did you become a libertarian? What's your personal journey towards libertarianism? I wonder sometimes if libertarianism isn't a um, genetic mutation of some type. Uh, on the one hand, I believe in Pareto's law, uh, the 80-20 rule. And uh, there are many, many varieties, uh, uh, variations of it. But uh, although I'm of the opinion that 80% of all human beings are basically good and decent, uh, the fact is, is that most people just don't think about personal philosophy, and they don't think about freedom, and they wind up voting for all these horrible people that want more laws and rules and regulations and taxation. So, um, I don't know. I guess I've always been a libertarian, to tell you the truth. Doug Casey, our guest here on This Week in Money. And Doug, when you were at Freedom Fest, a strange venue, Las Vegas, what was going on there? Why Las Vegas? Well, Las Vegas is is, uh, the convention center of North America. It's the convention center of the world. And uh, people like going to Las Vegas because you can walk around the streets holding a drink in your hand. You can smoke more places than you can anywhere else in North America. There's gambling. And I went to Vegas early just because I like to play poker, and I did a lot of that, too. Great line, Doug, here from uh, Jeff Berwick, who says, Much like Vegas, most things in the USSA are fake and illusory. And it's uh, probably a a pretty good analogy for what's going on in the country generally. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm not crazy about a lot of aspects of Vegas, but uh, I'm no longer crazy about a lot of aspects of the United States itself. (laughs) Quite frankly, it used to be America, but now it's just turned into another nation state, undistinguished uh, in any way except for the fact that freedom is rapidly diminishing in this country. One of the things you've been talking about for a while uh, is getting out of the U.S., not just going away, but getting a, a, a second passport, a, a citizenship in, in another country. Why do you, what's the advantage there? Well, I think this uh, escapade with Edward Snowden, uh, who... Um, compromise the NSA's secrets recently is indicative of why everybody should have more than one passport. He's trapped in Russia now, and he can't leave, uh, uh, well, for a number of reasons. But one of them is that the uh, U.S. government canceled his passport. So uh, that's uh, problematical, uh, according to the uh, laws and the rules of these nation states. Of course, I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't, no, nobody should have to have a passport. And a hundred years ago, nobody needed a passport to go anywhere, to enter the U.S., to enter Canada, yeah. Europe, anywhere you wanted to go. You didn't need a passport at all. All you needed was the money to sustain yourself when you got to a place. So passports started out as a convenience uh, issued by a government asking the ruler of the country next door to treat you well. But uh, now they've become a means of controlling people. So, uh, no, I'm not a fan of passports. But as long as we live in a world that, uh, where they're necessary, you should have more than one so that you're not under the control of just one group of uh, 
politicians or political criminals sometimes. Doug, you were pretty uh, bleak in your assessment of the, of the future, what's going on in uh, in the USA. A couple of, uh, of words here, uh, edge of chaos, perfect storm, disaster. Well, from an economic point of view, we're emerging from the eye of the financial hurricane that we entered in 2007. And as we go through the trailing edge of this hurricane, it's going to be much more serious and much more long-lasting than what we had in 2007 and 8 and 9. Um, it's going to be very ugly. So um, hold on to your hat. Uh, Any time in between tomorrow morning and a year from now, <laughs> uh, we're going to be in the middle of something very big. Doug, as far as places to go, places to run, places to hide, uh, you, you've mentioned a, a few places. Uh, one of the things uh, somebody asked me uh, was to ask you about Canada. said, you know, a couple of years ago, Doug said he should have become a Canadian citizen. What happened there? Well, I was spending a lot of time up in Vancouver uh, back, in the, um, back in the late 80s, the early 90s. Uh, I had a nice house on the waterfront in West Van. And uh, at that point, I should have become a landed immigrant and uh, become a Canadian. At that point, I could have uh, dropped my U.S. passport uh, with no penalties. But now, uh, just as the Soviet Union used to have, uh, the U.S. has a severe exit tax for anybody that's got uh, meaningful assets. Uh, they really want to pe penalize you for uh, getting out of the system. So I missed the boat by uh, uh, not becoming a Canadian when I had the opportunity. I'm, I regret that, actually. We're sorry, too, but it's good to have you back here uh, at the end of July. The Capitalism and Morality Seminar is what's going on. And here's the link. I'll spell it out for you. Uh, it's a Jayant Bandari. It's J-A-Y-A-N-T-B-H-A-N-D-R-I.com. The Capital and uh, Capitalism sorry, and Morality Seminar, Vancouver. Doug, what brings you up for that? And, and uh, what are you going to be talking about there? Well, I'll be up for the uh, Agora seminar before it and uh, Giants uh, uh, annual seminar on capitalism and freedom. And basically what I'm going to be doing is uh, this year I've given speeches in years past, but this year I'm just going to have a conversation with Rick Rule. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Rick and I are going to talk about uh, things we're both interested in, which is uh, money, the markets, freedom. Uh, and try to talk about things that are of practical practical interest to um, the audience. So I'd like to uh, invite any of your listeners that are interested in money and freedom, and of course money constitutes freedom, to uh, spend the day with us at that seminar. You'll meet a lot of interesting people. Great line from uh, Rick Rule here. Your biggest problem is not the state and its tyranny, but what is between your two ears. Rick is absolutely right. It's all a matter of psychology. It really is. Uh, it's, it's like that song about uh, Bob Poker, uh, that um, uh, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. But uh, one of the lines in that song is, every hand's a winner, every hand's a loser. And it's all a question of your psychology. Uh, whether you're playing that game or the game of life. So that's quite correct. Doug Casey from CaseyResearch.com here on This Week in Money. Let's talk, Doug, about uh, something that seems to be holding our attention a lot these days. Gold, uh, what's going on with gold? We are here in a bull market for gold, uh, but here in Canada we're scratching our heads because mining stocks are the cheapest they've been in five or six years or so. Yes. Uh, of course, I've been playing with gold and mining stocks for more years than I care to count. <laughs> uh, actually, it's been more than 40 years at this point that I've been involved in the markets. I can't believe it. And I've seen many markets like this, or let me say not many, but at the bottom in 2001, 2002, stocks were down probably 98%, an unbelievable number from their previous peak, which was 1997. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, bear markets. There have been about a half a dozen bear markets that are really serious in the last 40 years that I've been watching uh, the market. But um, this one's a spectacular bottom. 
And uh, I think that uh, now is an ideal time to establish speculative positions in quality junior mining stocks. And I emphasize quality because half of them are bankrupt. Uh, They're walking dead. Uh, They have no money. They have no management. They have no properties. All they have is a publicly traded shell that says gold someplace in its name. (laughs) So stay away from those. There are really quality companies that do have management, money, properties, all these things. Uh, Buy those now. Your odds are excellent of getting uh, 10 to 1 on your money in the next few years, in my opinion. And, Doug, you should remind us again that these things are not heirlooms, as you said before, and it's worth repeating again. They're burning matches. They're not meant to be kept around for a long time. That's absolutely correct. Uh, Gold is something that you put away and you forget about. It's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. But the mining stocks are a different game entirely. They're strictly trading sardines or speculative vehicles. Quite correct, though. Doug, any difference between the little junior companies and some of the bigs like Barrick or Newmont? I'm not interested in the big companies, quite frankly. Uh, Most of the big mining companies today are run by what we call professional managers. They don't own shares in the company, or if they do, it's because they got cheap options. They're giant bureaucracies, uh, the, the slow moving. It, it, no, I'm not interested in the big companies. In addition to the fact, uh, mining is a crappy business. Yeah, yeah. It's a 19. It's, it, it's it's critical. It's essential for the economy, but uh, it's a crappy business. It's a 19th century choo choo train business. So um, there's a lot of downside and limited upside in these big clunky majors. I stick with the juniors that are nimble and run by entrepreneurs. Great line, uh, Doug, from uh, Jeff Clark, uh, talking about a rare anomaly in the uh, gold market over at uh, CaseyResearch.com. Uh, it says the messages from history are right there in front of us. Number one, you got to be patient. And number two, you got to be prepared. There's an opportunity coming, right? I, I think we're in the opportunity right now. Uh, this is, <clears throat> like I said, one of the five or six times in the 40 years I've been involved in these resource markets that, the odds are very much in your favor to uh, buy these things as a speculator. So, yeah, we're as we talk, this is, uh, I, I, I think we're in the midst of a, a gigantic opportunity. Most assets in the world today are grossly overpriced because all of these governments everywhere in the world have been printing up trillions of currency units, and it's created bubbles. It's made the stock market in general overpriced, uh, real estate overpriced, especially in Canada, although it's coming down. Uh, and we're in the biggest bubble in, the, in world history in the form of the bond market. Uh, that's an accident yeah. waiting to happen, yeah. a gigantic disaster waiting to happen uh, as interest, interest rates go back up to normal levels and then beyond. So I think that uh, from a speculative point of view, Uh, Junior mining stocks are the place to be, and to conserve assets, uh, you should buy physical gold and silver. Doug Casey is founder and chairman of Casey Research. Doug's at CaseyResearch.com. Don't forget the Capitalism and Morality Seminar, Vancouver, Saturday, July 27th. GiantBondari.com is the uh, link there. A Casey Research Summit coming up in Tucson, October 4, 5, and 6. That's at CaseyResearch.com. And if you're looking for some summer reading, i got a book for you. Totally incorrect. Conversations with Doug Casey uh, in paperback and electronic versions. Hey, Doug, it's always good to talk to you. I'll talk to you soon, I trust, Phil. Coming up, Jim Goddard and Mike Swanson on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. The best of the best, Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. August 16th, Surrey, 17th, Chilliwack, September 14th, Kamloops. Details at randyelvisfrisky.com. I'm chatting with Mike Swanson, creator of the online newsletter, Wall Street Window. We're taking a look at how the markets did this past week. Hi, Mike, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you. Well, what was the the first thing when you look back over the week that hits you in the head and makes you kind of pay attention? Well, uh, I'm in the United States, and here um, everyone is really focused on the United States stock market because it's made new highs recently. and 
and has done well the past month after dipping uh, the month before that. Personally, I'm more interested in buying stuff outside the United States, and uh, I guess I should tell you tell you why. Um, the thing about the United States stock market is that it's gone up since 2009, and it's been one of the most bullish markets in the world the past couple of years. Uh, but it's gone up essentially uh, four years in a row, and it's in a mature bull market. And most of the time, or all the time in a, in a bull market, the big gains come at the beginning of one, and at the end sometimes you'll get a bubble blow-off, um, as we saw in 1999, as, and even in 2007, and you saw that in real estate. You saw that in silver prices a couple years ago. So... Most of the gains for the United States, they've already been made, and stocks in the United States are actually overvalued. Uh, if you look at the cyclically adjusted P, which takes the P average uh, for 10 years, averages it out adjusted to inflation, it's at about 23, or probably even higher this week, uh, which is a significantly uh, elevated level, uh, averages around 15, and and normally, you know, levels of 10 or lower are, are, are cheap. And historically, if you invest in a country where the cyclically adjusted P is below 10, you make uh, excellent gains of 20% or more over the next five years. And when it's an elevated level, you, you don't do very well. So that's the long-term <laughs> picture there. So if you want to look for cheap stuff, then you've got to look for sectors that are depressed that have been in bear markets. Uh, because when something's in a bear market, that bear market will eventually end, and and then, of course, you'll get a bull market, and bear markets bring cheap valuations. And in Europe, we saw that last year. We saw European markets uh, go through that euro crisis and, and collapse, uh, and some of them reach super low valuations. Uh, for example, I actually bought stocks in Greece uh, the, uh, last year, almost in July, August last year, uh, the Greek stock market got to cyclically just a P of below four. Uh, in fact, it's, it's still still down at that level. Uh, you could buy stocks of P's of two and three in Greece, and uh, and there even though the news is so bad, the valuations were so cheap that they've you know done the stocks have done well since then. And <clears throat> if you could do it, the other place in the world where you could get something at such a low price that you can make a hundred percent returns. If it, it, I don't own it, but someone could do it. Is Cyprus? If you, but you got to have an account in that country to to uh, own stuff there. So you'd have to get on an airplane and fly over there. But but the that you know that that crisis of the other month was a culmination of a bear market that took a couple years to play out. So these crashes and crises and stuff they are the end process of, of something that goes on for a long time and. The easiest thing, though, in, is um, the other thing that I think is a compelling uh, investment now is, frankly, commodities and, and gold and gold stocks, mining stocks, uh, because they've been in the bear market since 2011. We've seen them collapse twice this year, um, and they probably put in a bottom uh, a couple weeks ago. That said, I did think they bottomed the other month, too, but that's fine. They fell a little bit lower, but... Eventually, they're going to form their base and uh, go into new bull market, and you can buy these stocks paying 4% dividends, companies like Newmont. Um, you can buy ETFs like GDX and GDXJ and get similar dividends. Uh, one of the analysts that we talked to on a regular basis said uh, the reason he's hot on gold is that uh, – Companies right now are at the break-even point for the price, so they've told their workers just come in, come on in to do some care and maintenance around the place. We're not sending you home permanently. It seems to me that's about as low as you can get the price of gold to go. People won't produce it if they can't make a profit. No, no. I mean, you you could temporarily get lower, but you know, obviously, it it can't stay below that price very long because, <laughs> like you said, who's going to produce it? Yeah. And you were mentioning uh, Cyprus. Uh, Richard Knowles, the next guest on the show, has just returned from Cyprus. So he's got the, the inside. He has a parent who lives there, and he has oh, good wow. friends who can give you the whole inside. So we're going to be doing a lot about Cyprus coming up. 
Oh, great. Well, I'll listen in myself to, to hear what he has to say. Yeah, basically, uh, real estate uh, shysters there have been in existence since the Greeks invaded. Yeah. Like, uh, we're talking say. the Greeks uh, 3,000 years ago. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. not the, the Turkish-Greek thing that goes on there now. Well, well one other thing about, about the gold stocks, to give people uh, an idea of how cheap they are, uh, I mentioned Newmont, and, and, and you can get these dividends, uh, but there's a there's a valuation metric called the peg ratio, which is different than the PE. It, it measures not just the current earnings, but the five year earnings growth going forward, and divides it by the price. It's like a PE ratio that factors in growth too. And one is is essentially like having a PE of fifteen. It's being fully valued. And there's mining companies and the Vancouver Exchange and the Toronto Exchange that have these peg ratios of 0 0.10, 0 0.2. In other words, they're 90% undervalued or 80% undervalued. Uh, it gives you an idea of how cheap and beaten up these stocks have become. Um, and also the potential in them uh, once you know, they they go up. I mean, they probably already are starting their bull market, but uh, I, I want to be able to say for sure. And I'd have to see the you know HUI and XAU bakes out and you know, spend a little bit of time first. So I can't call exact bottoms or or tops, but uh, but you don't have to. You just recognize what the trend is, and if you can recognize a trend, a bullish trend early, it's the the returns you can make are pretty pretty good. Mike, uh, we were just talking about gold probably looks pretty hot right now. Any other commodities, silver, platinum, palladium, that looks really good right now? Well, I, I really like them all. And in fact, the silver um, companies themselves, the silver stocks, are actually, I think, the big ones like Hecla, Silver Wheaton, and um, Pan American, and so forth, they actually have better charts. Than the mining, the gold mining stocks do right now. They're they're performing better on a relative basis, and, and they tend to you know go up more when you have these commodity bull markets. So I'm so I'm real interested in the in the silver stocks too. Um, you know, all basically, <laughs> but almost all the commodities I'm, I'm really interested in. But really, the silver and, and the gold are the, are the most interesting. I'll tell you one other good play though in commodities that people don't really think about too much and I think is also an exciting way to participate in them is uh, shipping stocks um, because they've done the same thing um, the shipping stocks crashed last year and there's something called the Baltic Dry Index which uh, tracks shipping rates so you know when that's real high shipping companies can make a lot of money when it's real low of course they they don't very they don't make very much and since 2008 uh that's declined and it also the shipping companies and, and their earnings also tend to be closely cor correlated with what goes on in the commodity market and the price of oil and, and and so forth so what's happened with them is they crashed so much last year that many of them are priced uh as if they were going to go bankrupt um and they pay big dividends you know 5% some of them pay 10% uh, and so forth. There's an ETF SCA uh, that that people could buy if they want to, you know, look at the whole sector, and then you can go to the ETF and look at the components that make it up to to, to look for the individual stocks. But um, I think they're going to do very well going forward too. Somehow you have to get all those goods they build in China back over to North America. Exactly. And uh, bulk carriers, of course. We we never think about that. It's not all that sexy. It's not the love boat. No, no, no. And it it doesn't have a computer or something, or or it's not Facebook or whatever the fad of the moment is. <laughs> Again, an industry that's been around five thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Except we don't have people chained down and rowing. No, no, that's right. Although maybe they do somewhere. Uh, with the shipping, so. yeah, with shipping looking good, then it, it must make it brighter. Then, and you're saying commodities shipping very closely tied together. So, if we start to see uh, mining stocks for the precious metals start to go up, obviously, then uh, shipping they have to get the ore and the finished product around the world somehow. Their stocks will start to go up. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and they already are starting to, uh, to do that because what's kind of happened to the shipping stocks is they bottomed, uh, last fall. Uh, so there's, the stocks have formed a really long base and they're breaking out of it, uh, where they have just started to break out of it. So they bottomed way ahead of, of the gold stocks, which appear to have bottomed a couple of weeks ago. These things bottomed months ago. Um, and they tend to, you know, be leading sectors. Uh, so the thing about the markets too is one of the things that happened, um, the past couple of years is gold, you know, turned down in 2011. Uh, the shipping stocks did just about every market in the world actually went into or started a bear market in, in 2011 and ended it, uh, last, last year, except the United States. Uh, it was essentially the U.S. market was the only thing that did well, uh, from the middle of 2011 till, you know, going forward till now. Um, and that fact, I think, has blinded people, especially in the United States, to all these opportunities everywhere else. And they're just missing out, you know, essentially. And I think the gains for the U.S. are, you know, I don't know, really bearish on the U.S. stock market, but I just think these opportunities that we're talking about are, are so much greater at this point, and everyone's going to miss it. You know, they don't talk about gold on TV anymore. Uh, and because gold crashed, the sentiment, for gold is very negative when, when you do hear people talk about it. And then that's kind of what you want to see in, in a market. You don't want to be buying things when everyone else is and, and everyone is bullish and there's, you know, no one left to buy it. You want to buy it when no one's in. Well, and, and China we China are. is still buying gold like crazy. If they keep buying it at the current rate that they are, they'll hold about 35% of the world's physical gold. Yeah. And what will the Federal Reserve have but Treasury bonds? And, of course, uh, China has this policy now, too. If you want to have a second child, you have to buy at least $300,000 worth of real estate someplace else in the world than China. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, so uh, if you want to expand your family, then you have to expand China. That's the way I look at hmm. it. Yeah. It's yeah. an interesting policy. And, of huh. course, you know, there it's not a one-year plan or quarterly. It's 10, 50, 100 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the problem with uh with the U.S. and I don't I don't know when I say the U.S. I don't know if Canada, Canada and the U.S. Same. like we're we're tied to each other. Yeah, there, there's. But no... I don't know is the mentality among investors the same? Because the, the, what's here, very few people want to hold anything anymore. They just want to jump in and out. And they don't really look at the long term. No, no, not at all. I mean, it, I mean, you why you see it on television? If you watch CNBC, all they talk about is what's happening this moment, you know, or this minute. They never even talk about the valuations for companies or stocks. Um, you know, they just, like, if you talk about gold stocks, they say, oh, they're crashing, you know, gold's bad because it's gone down the past couple months. But they don't talk about what's the value you're, you're paying when you invest in gold versus And what's your five-year projection for it, sure. Yeah, versus buying Facebook or Apple or or Google or Microsoft, and you see what's happened in Microsoft today. It, it's fallen ten percent. Well, it can fall ten percent because it's got a high valuation. Mike, great talking to you, and we'll talk to you in a week after the break. Richard Knowles on this week in money. The best of the best, Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. August 16th, Surrey, 17th, Chilliwack, September 14th, Kamloops. Details at randyelvisfrisky.com. My guest is Richard Knowles of Knowles & Associates in Vancouver. He's a personal and corporate financial planner. And just back from a big vacation in Europe, you spent a lot of time in Cyprus, the heart of what we might call the Eurozone meltdown. Richard, what was the attitude there uh, amongst the people who have seen the government dip into their bank accounts to save the big banks? Hmm. Well, I have, a, I have a unique perspective there because um, one of my uh, in-laws, if you like, is is a pay is a counselor in Paya, which is one of the cities. Uh, she's the first uh, woman counselor in Cyprus, and she's the first woman Canadian counselor in Cyprus. Uh, she actually, uh, she's from Canada. She has no no Cypriot background. Uh, she's a Caucasian Canadian, but she's learned um, languages over the years, and she learned Greek while she was there because there was such a distress uh, amongst the 
uh, foreign tourists in Cyprus in the area, uh, in this area in particular, because it's um, uh, in Coral Bay, as they call it, in Cyprus. It's a very popular area. It's something like, uh, uh, well, any, any major tourist town in any uh, any hot location has more population of, of foreigners living there typically than they do uh, locals. So she's actually become a, a local councillor to represent those people on the city council. But to do so in any country like that, you actually have to learn the language. So it's quite a uh, quite a perspective I have uh, getting to know her. She's quite a brilliant woman. And uh, what I've learned through her are things that most people don't know. Certainly uh, the, the common person or the foreigner visiting would never have a clue. You, you have a perspective from the outside which seems as though things seem to be okay. You see some of the tourist towns... Um, uh, the ones along the coast, etc., they, they're doing quite well. Um, there, there are tourists coming. The, Brit- the British are coming, as they say. <laughs> uh, in this location, there's a, a, a very large um, expat community, expatriate com- community from Britain, but also there's a large uh, contingent of Russian money coming in and also now Chinese money. One of the more intriguing things happening internationally is the fact that China, Chinese people... Um, to be able to be allowed to have more than the allotted one child for per family in China, which is mandated, uh, they are given uh, an out to have more children, but they have to spend 300000 the equivalent of $300,000, um, I believe, uh, U.S., uh, at least in, in, in our, you know, when we convert to a, a currency we know, uh, outside the country, and they have to buy property in another country. So Cyprus has become a very popular location for the Chinese to come in. So there's a new uh, cash flow of Chinese coming in, uh, buying up properties. But we have to understand that every every location has its unique problems. In Cyprus, uh, the problem that's happened there, uh, well prior to the banking crisis, was that um, the country has been held ransom for a long time by the the developers, the real estate developers, who are what are basically known as the hidden government. Uh, there's the elected government, of course. There's the lawyers. There's, you know, the municipalities. But in every case and in every level, uh, payola is a, is a very, very big problem. And the developers, who are the real estate developers of the island, um, there's a handful which are very famous, infamous, actually. Um, they're both in criminal elements as well as um, the way that they um, meander around and trying to do deals in real estate. Uh, they've got everyone in their pockets. So we've got um, a typical kind of scenario that you hear about and read about in these, quote, and I'll use this term very loosely, third world situation, where you get um, um, where common kickbacks are very normal and, uh, you know, some of these brother gets the job over somebody more experienced, you know, that kind of thing's going on all the time there. But when we now take it down, that was going on before the banking crisis. So you could imagine... Uh, some of these developers, uh, they were with the lead people of the banks of the country. Um, they had, they were in the pockets of, it, of everybody. So the banks were involved as well. And so there were many um, defunct loans that were being lent out. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are being lent out of euros were being lent out to these developers, uh, even though they didn't have the credible uh, criteria to get it, uh, because the bank owners were getting some form of a kickback. So this is what was collapsing around them anyway, okay, to be frank. And the they were already being instigated, and in, in once they joined the European Union, um, the European Union laws protected uh, any European Union member, including expatri- expatriate foreigners that live there, against the transgressions of the, um, transgressions of the um, developers that were taking advantage of them. So long story short is, uh, then suddenly the banking crisis happens. So we've got the, the real banking crisis really fell onto Cyprus because of the defaulting of the Greek loans. So in Cyprus, really, uh, they are their own country, but they, on the Greek side of Cyprus, they are very uh, closely aligned to their mother, what they feel is their mother country, which is Greece. And so consequently, all of these Cypriot banks have very deep um, financial uh, ties to the to the large Greek banks. Now, when the Greek banks fell, of course, their defaulting loans, they're, def- you know, basically becoming shell, uh, um, uh, hollow shells of banks, uh, if you will, and they were completely depleted and they were only being supported by the European Central Bank. When that occurred, of course, all the defaulted loans and, and all the debts of Cy- Cypriot banks to the Greek banks 
also started to fall down. So it was a, it's what we call a domino effect. You know, one thing hits to the other. And that's what it brought it all down. Now, you already had an infrastructure of poor credit with these developers in Cyprus. So they were already, you know, <laughs> extended so many millions and millions and millions of euros that they were just not paying back. They had lots of assets. And right now what's happening is the Cypriot banks, um, under the auspice, we'll say, auspice uh, view of the, um, of the Central European Bank, are now being forced to go after these uh, defaulted loans of these, uh, uh, of these developers who are worth millions and millions of euros, have moved all their money off the island. And they continue to, to develop locally, but they claim they have no money. And they have assets, they have real estate. They're worth millions. You can see them the way they drive around. But uh, it's all, they've moved all their money out and they're claiming they're, they're, they're broke. So, you know, it's, it's just one crook stealing from another. Now, so that's Cyprus. But if you travel through um, many parts of that area, the, the low, there's many things that are flourishing. So within any, within any problem, there's flourishing positives. Um, their agricultural uh, sector is, is booming in many ways, as long as they, they've got exports as well, but most of it's for the island, and they grow everything. I mean, I'm telling you, this is a, an idyllic spot if you want to find a, an Eden of any kind. So we have, you know, everything being grown there. There's wines that are they're world-class, believe it or not, finally coming out of Cyprus. Uh, they don't leave Cyprus. They stay there. People buy it, and um, there is an, uh, an expat community, the majority of the people that are supporting the country right now are the wealthy Russians, um, any Brits that do come there, the Britons, uh, the British, and, um, and as I was mentioning, this, uh, this Chinese contingent now in the world that's seeking out uh, locations to invest money. Now, you see the Chinese going also into France quite a bit now with these bargains. They can buy businesses and, again, buy real estate, etc., to get this qualification to have more children. This is a big driving factor with many of the wealthy Chinese. So you see some of the, uh, you know, vineyards in, in France being bought up uh, by Chinese interests. And um, and we're seeing global global movements by the Chinese wealthy. You wouldn't expect to see that in Europe, would you? No, uh, well, it's or been we slowly happening it over time because of the exodus of the Chinese. The Chinese requirements are very strict. And because of that, uh, and also there's business in China, which is which is booming. So this this money is looking for places to to grow. It's growing within China. Certainly, there's a lot of development going on within China. Probably too much, and many arguably by many people, it's going too fast. But um, the international money is moving around quite a bit. And uh, you know, to be able to get into places like uh, Europe right now at the knockdown prices of many businesses, it gives you an entry level that, that is very affordable. Tourism is, is on the rise. Everybody I know personally out of Canada, it seems that when I was heading over, um, I had a pur- purpose to go and to see my father you know, on his 90th birthday. But uh, many people were traveling just because it was so inexpensive. The, the flights going there, there's some very competitive flights um, going to England, to Europe in general. Uh, places you can stay traveling in Europe, tourism is up because it's so reasonably inexpensive to go places. People are trying to knock down their prices simply because there's there's such high unemployment. They're trying to keep business going, and this is a great time to be doing it, tourist season. I know, too. Uh, we always look at the value of the Canadian dollar versus the American dollar, but the Canadian dollar, very strong versus the euro. Yeah, that that is a problem from a, a financial pricing perspective you know when you go over and you spend money um or that's not a problem it's a problem for them but it's great for us because we're getting a good exchange but it wasn't as good as it was a little while ago but still very attractive for us to get euros and to be able to go over and spend and that's yet another driving factor it's hard on the europeans uh because uh you know they but this has been a very big positive if you're an economist uh in germany you're you're very happy to be exporting uh, at higher volumes, you're happy, happier to be exporting your goods at these prices because people are, are – I've never seen so many German – made in Germany imports and everywhere from Rona Revy through to any of the, you know, major Sears or anywhere you go, it seems that there's more German – made in Germany uh, products and simply because it's more affordable to, to, to get them in now. I like the way Germany uh, dealt with the start of the economic crisis – the government gave everybody what was it, fifteen grand to buy a new car? Oh, <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> no, doesn't make, make, makes you wish makes you wish you were German. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so a year later, you know, their recession is over. Everybody has a new car. Yeah, it's a good way to start. Instead of bailing out the banks. Yeah, well, the German banks were are, were the most solid. Eh? So it was really when it was coming to bailing out, it was always the weaker banks that were that were structured incorrectly. Now, what's happening now from a from a financial standpoint is the Germans, the German banks, which are one of the big backbones of the European Central Bank, are really um, the whole German economy now is is in question because they've been pushed. It's been pushed so far that they've had to, you know, sort of. Uh, well, not the economy per se, but certainly the banking system has had to go and be pushed to its brink. And now the big issues are still there. Some of the biggest issues are you've got the German and French banks, and they've been the backbone of much of the European Central Banking System. There's no European Central Bank bond to finance the ECB. So therefore, it's all been done by the the, ba- the banks behind the scenes, um, Similar in a sense to the way the Federal Reserve is run in the U.S., where they're an independent organization, similar to the ECB, it's an independent organization. However, um, it in a sense answers to the U.S. government, and it has a mandate for being in 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 office in, in its in its business, but it's not a voted office to be in. And then it confers with all of the banks in the U.S. on its policy, but it still has the ultimate say as to what you know, the policy is. Uh, the ECB is very similar where it's a central banking system that doles out all the, the rules, etc. But in a sense, it isn't the ultimate decision maker. In this case, it still defaults to some of the largest central banks in that region, including the German banks and the, and the large French banks, Societe Generale, etc. Is there and a ECB, lot of, is, is there a lot of resentment against the Germans for having control of the money? Oh yeah. Oh, it's 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 enormous. You've 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 quoted some things yourself, uh, Jim, which reflect that. The, the Greeks, for example, in their austerity measures that they were being given, uh, said, "Well, look, we'll do this, but you return the money from World War II." I mean, uh, the resentment goes back to when Nazi Germany was still here. Um, you know, I mean, we we in in North America have a very short-lived memory. Honestly, we we we're only a couple of hundred years old, really. But in Europe, you've got a completely different mindset. And for those of your listeners that are European and, and go travel there and, or have relatives that are European and living with them here in Canada, they know well what I speak. Uh, it, the hatreds in many cases run very deep, you know, if they've been very long lived. You know, the Israeli Palestinian, for example, is a great example of uh, thousands of years of, of distress, uh, you know, going on there well beyond what we know in this modern day world. And, you know, the Greeks and the Turks, I mean, they go back for, oh, I don't know, I think it was 2000 BC when they started their warring. Thanks to our guests, Doug Casey, Mike Swanson, and Richard Knowles. And thanks to Jim Goddard for filling in over the summer. I'm Phil Mackesy. I'll see you in September. Jim is back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.